And it is my great pleasure to invite the moderator of this panel, Ambassador John Herbst, Director, Atlantic Council, Eurasia Center. The floor is yours. My job here is to introduce our speakers, but I have a long record of having very short introductions because normally our speakers are eminent people who, who are known. So our first the first person who I'll ask questions of is not with us. It's the Deputy Minister of Energy, Mr. Demchenkov, in Kiev. He'll be joining us virtually any second. I don't know if we can zoom him in right now for this moment. If not... Aha! Mr. Deputy Minister, thank you for joining us. And then, the second person I'll be asking questions of is the new head, of, relatively new head of NAFTA House, Mr. Chernyshev. If you come here, former minister, and someone who knows the energy business really well. Now, perhaps the most important of the international financial institutions for Ukraine is the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And we're fortunate today to have with us the president of the bank, uh, Ms. Renee Renaud, President Renaud Bosbassa. Basso, excuse me. And finally, we have another friend of Ukraine who's very well known working on Ukrainian issues in the U.S. Congress for the last th almost 30 years, um, Senator or outgoing Senator Rob Portman. Okay. 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 All right. So thank you all for joining us and thank you all for attending. It's going to be a very, very good show, by which I mean learning a lot, and I think we'll keep you interested as well. So, as I said, we'll start with, from Kiev, we have Deputy Minister Demchimkov. Uh, Mr. Deputy Minister, the UN figure that's used for Moscow's targeted attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure is they've taken out 50% of that infrastructure. So those figures are actually a little bit old. They go back six to eight weeks. Do you think this estimate is still valid, or are the, is the figure different? And I'll have another follow-up question after you answer that. Ambassador Herbst, Madam President, Senator, Mr. Chernyshov, it's a great honor for me to present the Ministry of Energy on this panel. Unfortunately, Minister Galushenko is with President Zelensky at the moment, so I am taking part in this discussion in his stand. Thank you for this very appropriate question. It is very important to make sure that the global community gets a true picture of the current situation in energy sector and in whole Ukraine. You mentioned that 50% of our energy infrastructure has suffered from Russian attacks, and you saw this in video. In fact, this figure changed all the time. After we repeat our and repaired our energy system, Russians attack it's again and again. Also, it is tricky to measure the impact because the destruction of one key substation can cut off electricity supply for a couple million people. Indeed, the situation is very grave. All through the full-scale invasion, our power system was frequently a target of shelling. And since October 2022, it has survived 12 massive missile attacks and 14 drone attacks. All sectors of Ukrainian energy system are affected. Nuclear, thermal power plants, hydroelectric, solar and wind generation, transmission and distribution grids, as well as our gas production and coal mines. Ukraine, unfortunately, our country is facing two major challenges. The first is Diversity, uh, uh, the first was is delivery, and this is really important, delivery affordable electricity to all consumers. The other one is the generation 
a deficit of several gigawatts. Today, we are in great uh, need of support from our partners, and there is no time to wait, really. This is really important to have this support. What we need most of all is high voltage transformers, but the list is much longer. I want to use this opportunity to call on our international partners to continue providing the support. Of course, we do receive assistance, and thank you so much for this needed assistance. It is extremely valuable and appropriate and appreciated, but this is not nearly enough. Half of our energy infrastructure has been affected, and the war is still happening. We need assistance to carry out repairs and to have at least some emergency reserves. A very appropriate vehicle for this is the Ukraine Energy Support Fund that was established under the Energy Community Secretariat. To date, this fund has called and collected 156 million euros, and the USAID is handling the procurement. And our Minister of Energy prepares the list of needs based on the signals we receive from the energy companies. And our international partners verify this list, and this is really important because the point uh, I want to make there is uh, the, uh, uh, that this fund uh, very transparent and, and, and countable. So I invite everyone to join this important initiative. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Okay, uh, Mr. Chernyshev. Following several defeats on the battlefield, Moscow launched this campaign against Ukraine's infrastructure, which, by the way, is a war crime. Um, the idea was to bomb Ukraine into submission and distract Ukraine's military. Has this been the result? Also, what has been the impact of Moscow's bombing campaign on Ukraine's gas infrastructure, and what has Naftahaz been doing about this? Yeah, thank you very much, Ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to welcome you in this, I would say, very important session during these intensive days in Davos. Yesterday, I have learned what is Davos on the oil and gas CEO dinner. And it was said that Davos is the place where billionaires explain to millionaires <laughs> what middle class needs. <laughs> <laughs> Our topic is absolutely different. We now represent the war zone and the country struggling for its liberty, future, and democratic values. We have all learned that cheap gas comes at a price, the price of stability and the price of security. We all understand that obviously Russia can no longer be treated as a trusted supplier of energy as it uses energy as a weapon. And we all experience it for a long time already. Russians are trying to deprive Ukrainians from basic services like heating, water, electricity, trying to target civilian infrastructure. This strategy will not work. This will only increase our determination to win this war. Yes, we have experienced attacks, especially after October 10, on our civil infrastructure, 50% of which, as it was said, was damaged. The oil and gas infrastructure is not an exclusion, even though it was not hit that much as electric grid. Nevertheless, we are standing united in order to prevail in this war. And Ukrainian people are demonstrating incredible, incredible will uh, to go ahead. So do our people, employees of energy segment, that are definitely heroes right now, defending power supply to the homes and households of Ukrainians. Naftogaz provides gas 
to at least 12 million households in Ukraine and do it in more than stable manner. And I believe that we can be proud of our employees that have secured gas supply to 300,000 of households in Donbas, risking their lives constantly. And I think this is a good example how Ukraine will go ahead and will prevail and of course will not use any of the Russian energy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Madam President, the EBRD has been a major actor in Ukraine since the 90s. How do you view the energy situation there in light of the Kremlin attacks? And what has the EBR been doing in helping Ukraine maintain, repair, and replace the energy system? Thank you. And indeed, um, EBRD has been very active in Ukraine in the last 30 years. I think we, were, we have been the first in institutional investor in the country. And so and my analysis is that the war is not only it's on two fronts. There is a military battle, but there is also an economic war. And um, of course, as EBRD, we have a bank. We are not intervening at all on the military, and it's not our job. But we can help on the economic uh, battle. And that's why, since the beginning of the war, the EBRD has been extremely committed to find ways to continue to support, to finance projects in Ukraine, and to provide appropriate support. And we have even stepped up our investment. Before the war, we were doing something like 1 billion of investment a year. Last year, in 2022, we have done 1.7 billion. So taking more risk and really because we really believe that supporting the economy, keeping electricity working, keeping the heating, keeping the light uh, and the heating system functioning is absolutely key for the country to be able to fight the war and to win the war. And if there is no economy, if there is, uh, if uh, companies cannot function, if, there is, if the people do not have work, do not have access to electricity, do not have access to heating, they cannot survive. We've been able to do that thanks to a lot of donor support in order to share the risk because the bank is always aware and needs to preserve it, I mean, and to take into account the risk and to balance it. And so we are taking half of the risk on our balance sheet, half, half we get some donor support. I want to thank the US, which was the first one giving the example and giving us a huge amount of support, but other in the EU, EU countries have also provided a lot also to help us to provide support to Ukraine. And our focus has been very much the key infrastructure um, and the private sector. So I will focus on the key infrastructure because this is what we are discussing today. We've started very and we had a lot of projects ongoing with our clients, Ukraine Ergo, uh, Ukraine Salinitsa, and so forth. But because of the war situation, all, all these investments were not relevant anymore. So we shifted very quickly to provide liquidity support to these companies in order to be able to sustain, you know, revenues were collapsing, they had expenditure to, um, if, if only to pay the staff and to um, bring the raw material and so forth. So we started to provide liquidity support with a credit of uh, 150 million to uh, Ukraine Ergo, and also engaged very early on with Naftogaz on how we could help the company to buy gas in order to be safe in terms of, of storage and capacity to ensure the functioning of the heating system and address the needs of the country. And so we built uh, with donors a financing mechanism where we take part of the financing and we have guarantees to do so. The situation changed dramatically with the beginning of the attacks in uh, October 2020, attacks on the um, civilian infrastructure. Because then it's re now, in these current circumstances, it's really a fight against uh, the clock in order to be able, because there is a high level of destruction, as we just heard, and the companies have to be able to step in very quickly and um, have the necessary resources, financial, but also in terms of access of material, to be able to repair quickly, extremely quickly. And I really want to pay tribute and to acknowledge the courage, the braveness, the commitment of all the workers in, in, um, in Ukraine, in these companies, and their demonstration of 
the commitment to support the country, whatever it takes, and to be able to deliver the services population needs in order um, to be able to survive. And I think that it's something which makes us all very humble when we see the capacity to react and the capacity really to address very quickly uh, and repair very quickly, as quickly as possible. And that's why I think the international community feels also so committed and so, you know, have a duty to provide the necessary resources to be able to the companies, to the Ukrainian people, to um, deliver the, what they have delivered and to continue to deliver. So we have stepped up to short a bit. We have stepped up our financing support, providing an additional 300 million to uh, Ukraine Go, with um, on top of that 72 million of grant support from Netherlands, which is a very important component also because in order we need at some point of time to take into account the capacity of the company to sustain high level of debt. So it's very welcome to have some grant support. And this is, I think this is the, one of the quickest projects we have ever done in EBRD. In, uh, we, went, we were in Kiev in end of October, met the president of Ukraine Ergo, understood that it was really a big issue. And in, before Christmas, in beginning of December, we had the project approved and now uh, in the process of being disbursed. And we've also stepped up our financing to Naftogaz, thanks to support from Norway, with an additional, on top of our 300 million, an additional financing to grant support from Norway of 200 million, which we are now in the process of disbursing. So we are ready to continue to do that. We committed to do 3 billion between 22 and 23, so we still have a lot of capacity and we will continue to provide support. Thank you, that's quite a list of actions. All right, Senator Portman, you've been a strong supporter of Ukraine, uh, an American aid to Ukraine against Kremlin aggression, recognizing that defeating Putin in Ukraine is vital for US security and US prosperity. This is not just a gift to Ukraine. Moscow's failure on the battlefield as we've taught, has led to this massive bombing campaign, a war crime. Has this campaign, in your judgment, had an impact on Ukraine's ability to fight? And how do you assess the U.S. and the European response, the EU special, to this situation? Well, first of all, Ambassador Herbst, thank you for your commitment to Ukraine and you're providing us with a lot of good uh, data in the Congress to be able to <laughs> provide aid. Um, and to my colleagues, thank you for being here. What you've seen today is extraordinary, isn't it? Um, who would have thought uh, four or five months ago when the attacks began in earnest on infrastructure that you would have uh, the opportunity through the good work that EBRD is doing and NAFTA Gas and Oleska, you personally um, and the ministry of energy to be able to have enough gas for this winter, as an example, it's, it's amazing, um, and to be able to respond to these illegal, totally unprovoked and brutal attacks on civilian infrastructure. These are non-combatants. And uh, we were talking earlier, Alesky and I, about the danger. Uh, I've been to Ukraine many times, as you all know, and uh, I think I've been there three, I guess five times since the, uh, the invasion, but three times in Kyiv. And one day they wanted to take us to see what had happened a couple days earlier, so they took us to the public utility to see where the Russian missiles had attacked the control station. They had the Soviet era plans, obviously, and they knew where to attack. And um, as you know, people have been killed to these attacks. But Oleski has also sent a thousand civilian workers from NAFCO gas to the front lines to provide, uh, you mentioned energy for 300,000 people um, who are uh, in the Donbass on the Ukrainian controlled side. That's courage and bravery too. So as we sit here today and there are troops who are living uh, very uncomfortably and in great danger in uh, trenches in uh, Bakhmut, uh, we salute all of them, but that includes the civilian workforce and, and everything that everyone has done to, to try to respond to this energy crisis. It's, tra it's a tragedy. It is clearly a war crime in my view because you're targeting civilians. And I hope that the United States government continues to provide assistance. I know that may be your next question, John. Uh, but we have said with regard to EBRD and this idea of helping on infrastructure that rather than put, putting more and more money into the deficit, more and more money into the humanitarian programs, 
wouldn't it be better to put some money into actually creating an economy where people can stay and live? And that's why, by the way, the Patriot missiles are so important. Um, that's good news. The Patriot missiles are on their way. Uh, Ukrainians are being trained on them right now uh, and the other air defenses uh, because that will bring people back to home and back to work and, and get the economy going, but also this infrastructure. I think it's a very uh, appropriate investment. And so thank you for mentioning that because the taxpayers of America are the ones who are providing that. And um, we have to let them know that we are grateful and that it is working and creating the ability for people to live um, and to try to get this economy back on, on track. So I guess my answer to your question uh, specifically, Ambassador, would be better uh, for uh, the ministry to answer, of course it's affected Ukraine, what's happened, of course. And of course it's affected the economy, but the actions and the continual um, amazing uh, ability of Ukraine to respond to this unprecedented and again unprovoked brutal assault uh, is also is is so impressive and we've seen that today the refor the resourcefulness and the bravery and courage okay senator thank you very much for that okay do we have Kiev still on the line yes deputy mr Demchenkov. The partial destruction of Ukraine's energy infrastructure may also provide you with the necessity of not just repairing the system, but starting to rebuild it. Of course, after Ukraine wins the war, which will happen, this will be part of the overall reconstruction and transformation of the country, something we've all been waiting for. So, how do you plan to rebuild the energy infrastructure of Ukraine? Oops. <laughs> Moscow is calling. <laughs> Well, let's give him 30 seconds and then I'll improvise. <laughs> okay, let's move on to our next question. You can answer which, the question. Oh, there you go. You, you heard the question? I'm Sorry, I'm back here. I have some uh, troubles with uh, internet connection. Uh, Did you hear the question? Uh, Ambassador, yeah, I'm busy, busy, busy with you. Uh, uh, Ambassador, thank you. Uh, really, President Zelensky announced three main priorities for the development of our power system, a broader role for nuclear and green energy, and decentralized energy system. These priorities will be the pillars of our updated energy strategy for the coming decades. And our ministry right now doing this exercise together with international partners. And we see that by 2040, we plan a complete phase out of coal in electricity. And the role of coal will decrease significantly after 2032. The share of renewables in the energy mix is expected to reach 25% in 2032 and double that by 2050. By 2032, we plan to build two new nuclear units and launch pilot projects of small model reactors. Coal phase out will go in parallel with the construction of new solar and wind generation, new CHP plants on biofuels. Before the war, we were saying that the energy transition for the Europe, for the European Union, would be incomplete without Ukraine. Now, in this time, we see, we all realize that this will not be happened without Ukraine. This is really our important task to speed up energy transition after our victory, when we will celebrate our victory. And this is very important message for all of our business partners and for community, international community, that this is proper time to start communication regarding new projects in energy sector after our victory. Because this is proper time to identify areas for our further cooperation, how we will support our regions and how we will support our energy sector and develop our energy sector for very, uh, let's say, 
uh, fast recovery of our regions and increase our uh, economy. And this is our task. Uh, this is our task uh, for today. And we have really, really good cooperation with our international partners on in this in this sphere. Thank you. I'm going to send you a second question, which is a little bit off the topic, but only a little bit. Uh, the IAEA and Ukraine recently agreed that the IAEA should have a permanent presence at Ukraine's nuclear power plants to ensure their safety during the war. Of course, the key area here is the nuclear plant uh, in the Zaporizhia Oblast. Uh, and this has been very tense since the early days of March when Moscow took control of the facility and began completely irresponsibly to conduct military attacks from around the facility and perhaps even from within the facility. I think we lost him again. Oh, no, he's there. Yeah. We're good. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this question. Important, because in uh, his, his formula uh, at the G20 summit, President Zelensky spoke about 10, point, uh, 10 points. And the first point was radiation and nuclear safety. And in, on this account, it is our priority to have a close cooperation with the International Atomic Energy Agency. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has been occupied in the 1st of March last year. And Russia has violated all seven pillars of nuclear safety. This was confirmed by our all international partners and by the IAEA. The IAEA experts are permanently present at the Parisian plant since last September. And their possibilities are uh, limited, unfortunately, but at least we have an international presence there. And the situation is indeed incredibly tense, especially for the staff, for the staff of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And Russian attacks on the infrastructure also pose risk to other nuclear power plants in Ukraine, especially during recent large-scale attacks. That's why at the Paris conference, our president requested the IAEA to establish continued presence uh, at, 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 at all our nuclear power plants. And we work with, inter with this agency on this, and we have very clear action plan and uh, right now we have even Grossi in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, yesterday he had a meeting with our prime minister. And uh, this, is, this is really important to have representatives of, uh, of, uh, this agency, uh, of this agency at all our nuclear power plants. And uh, I think that, uh, that the world uh, right now very close, very close, uh, uh, very close to uh, accident, to another accident, and uh, we should uh, protect war, and we should do everything to stop this uh, occupation. We, do, we should do everything to uh, 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 to uh, that Russian leave uh, our nuclear power plant and Russian uh, must be stopped. And this is very important for us right now. Significantly increased sanctions, sanctions on Russian nuclear industry. We should send a clear signal to the world that in near future, when partners will be, will be ready, with, with all partners will be ready, the Russian nuclear industry must disappear from markets. And this is really important, denuclearize Russia and stop doing business as usual with Russian uh, uh, nuclear industry, with Russian business in this, uh, in, in this area. And this is really important that 
the, the, a lot of countries still has dependent on Russian products uh, in, in, new, in nuclear industry. And uh, we are ready to share our experience, experience of our countries, how we could uh, help uh, uh, the, uh, diversify these, uh, these sources. And th this is an uh, important contribution from, from Ukraine. How does Ukraine can do, uh, can to develop its energy security uh, uh, and uh, security of the whole uh, uh, continent? Um, thank you, Mr. Minister. I think you just gave us one of the headlines out of the session. And I, host, I hope Ross Atom is listening. Because we're coming for you. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chernyshev, uh, since Moscow's February offensive, we have seen the remarkable decoupling of Europe from dependence on Russian oil and gas. And Europe is coping with its energy needs this winter. Now observers are suggesting, and you've already said this earlier at Davos, that next winter the absence of Russian gas could produce an energy crisis, since one, this winter has been mild, and two, before the sharp reduction of Russian gas imports, European storage facilities were full of Russian gas. Do you believe that Europe will be able to satisfy its energy needs next winter, and how might Ukraine contribute to that under your leadership? Ambassador, thank you very much for this question. First of all, uh, I would like to admit that we are in the middle of the winter right now and we are concerned whether Ukraine has enough of natural gas to go through. I would like to use this opportunity and publicly announce that yes, we do have enough of gas to go through this winter. And it has been secured by the intensive assistance and help of one, EBRD, our international partners, mainly United States, United Kingdom, Canada, France, Germany, and Norway. An excellent work of our oil and gas companies in Europe. Number two, it has been secured by heroic work of NAFTA gas employees that are keep on production of natural gas in Ukraine, and this is the most important thing we should all realize. This winter is about to finish within two or three months. And uh, we are concentrated already on the next winter. We should not expect next winter going to be easier. Uh, we have started preparation for the next winter already. No one guarantees that it's going to be more comfortable, more mild, or anyhow light. And we are preparing. Of course, NAFTA gas is planning to increase production of natural gas in Ukraine, as well as consider energy efficiency measures. And, of course, we should seriously and responsibly consume all our energy in Ukraine and in the world, remembering that energy in some situation might be an enemy, which is we are witnessing right now. But anyway, Ukraine is totally reliable in terms of gas supply right now. We will go through this winter and we will be prepared for the next one to come. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Madam President, the, the assistance to Ukraine provided by the US, the EU, the international financial institutions, with the EBRD playing a leading role, has been extraordinary. The community international is now starting to look at plans for the reconstruction and transformation of Ukraine when the war ends. Would you please share your visions to how this might look and your role, the EBRD role, so especially in energy? I think that we will remain extremely committed and we expect and we are willing and ready to play an important role and key role in the reconstruction. As far as the energy sector is concerned, I think that the, the, of course the first priority will be to repair, but I think we need to build that. I mean, so it's something, an expression that has been very much used after COVID, but I think in the, in the Ukrainian situation it will be extremely important, build back better. and. In a way, and I think this is really the plan also of the government, as we've heard, is to use the reconstruction as a way to transform the country. And in the energy sector, that means, first of all, I think to um, enhance the connectivity with the EU. And uh, you know that the system, the electric system has been connected with the European network of transmission. This has been extremely 
useful and, and helpful in the context of the of the war, but um, synchronization uh, will be um, further synchronization will be important and it will be an important area for investment. Moving beyond that, the development of renewable energy will be very important. We, this was this had started. I mean, there there are a lot of renewable already in Ukraine, but of course we need to go beyond and uh, EBRD is very much ready to develop auctioning framework, work, work with the government in order to attract foreign investors. I'm sure there will be a lot of appetite to invest in renewable uh, framework and, and energy in uh, post-war. When you develop renewable, you need to enhance the transmission grid. So this will be also a very important area of uh, investment. We need also to think about the cities and sustainability of cities and having smart, sustainable green cities. There will be, I mean, when you see the level of destruction of some cities, huge investment will be needed, but it will need to be the best standards investment um, available worldwide with uh, energy efficiency as one of the key priority and also integration of distributed generation. Um, distributed generation. In terms of investment, I think when we think about it, probably investment in storage capacity with private investors will be also a great opportunity. So all this to flag that there will be a lot of investment needed and there will be a lot of opportunities for private investment to contribute to this uh, reconstruction effort. One word of one element which will be very important in this and already very important and moving forward remain a key issue and I think that it's the quality of the governance of the companies and we are very happy to see now the board of Naftogaz being um, put in place. And I think that the reform that has been taken on, the, on Ukraine Ergo and the transformation of the governance of Ukraine Ergo before the war has been a huge asset in the current situation. It has facilitated a lot the connection with the European network and it was really the right thing to do. And this will be, I think, a key strength moving forward uh, in order to enhance development in uh, this uh, energy sector. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Senator Portman, uh, some observers of this crisis, the Russian war on Ukraine, are concerned about the failure of a vocal but small minority of Republicans to recognize America's great interest in stopping the Russian aggression in Ukraine. And the fear is this might lead to a drop in U.S. assistance. Uh, do you expect the U.S. to continue with substantial support to Ukraine? And what else might the U.S. do to help Ukraine in the energy sector? Well, let me answer the, the, the first question, uh, because it is on everybody's mind, and I heard about it a lot this week. Um, by the way, I'm delighted that Davos is talking about this. It's a war. It's in Europe. It's 1,500 miles away. People are dying today. So it's appropriate that there have been a lot of discussions. And I thank you for having the Ukraine House here for a place to convene in addition to what's happening at the Congress Center. Um, look, I, I'm going to do something that probably is not appropriate because many of you are very effective at talking to um, American uh, uh, colleagues of mine, uh, and many of you know them well. Uh, I see Andy Futo is here representing uh, the diaspora in the United States, and many of you are engaged already, but I'll give you a few suggestions. Um, the argument that this is about freedom and that we are, all of us, being uh, freedom-loving countries around the world, therefore affected by this, is true. Sometimes that falls on deaf ears, to be frank. The argument that uh, this is a precedent that would be horrible to send to other authoritarian regimes that they could waltz into a neighboring country uh, is sometimes effective. But those two arguments have not been as effective as I would hope they would be with some of my colleagues. So let me suggest a couple of others, which are uh, absolutely true as well. One is think about the alternative. What if the U.S. had not spent billions of taxpayer dollars, $40 billion at the end of the year, significant amount of resources to help with regard to energy, by the way, and AID is doing a great job, in my view, of helping with the energy fund, and we talked about the EBRD support. But what if we had not done that? What if America had not led? And to my European friends in the room, I think you would agree with me, if America had not led, it would be a very different situation right now in terms of the military dynamic. Right now, Kiev would be under 
Russian control. We wouldn't be having this video uh, with the government freely elected by the people of Ukraine. The occupation would lead to, obviously, a lot of human rights abuses we'd be hearing about. If you believe what Putin has said, it wouldn't just be Ukraine, because it's about the Russian Federation recreating it, or it's about the Russian Empire, or it's about something bigger, including many other countries in the region. But think if it was just Ukraine, even. The amount of expense that America and the world, and the free world, would be putting into helping to defend the borders of now an additional four countries that are NATO allies with Article 5 responsibilities by us, meaning a mutual defense, that are now on the border with Russia. So to my Polish friends in the room, what would it be like, Slovakia, Romania, the Baltic states? So uh, my view is that's an effective argument because you can say, and we've done some numbers on this, think of the weapons and the soldiers that would have to be on the border uh, in order to help defend now Europe. And it would be far more dislocating in terms of the economy and in terms of the impact on inflation and other issues. So I hope you'll make that argument. Another is to allow those who are skeptical and maybe having fatigue to know what's worked. And we talked today about energy, and it's extraordinary to me what's happened and what has worked in the face of just unbelievable attacks on the civilian infrastructure and the bounce back. But think about the HIMARS and how effective they've been. The fact that not one of these HIMARS, at this point at least, has been destroyed by the Russians. Unbelievable. They shoot and they scoot. And they've been very effective. And that's why we're in Kherson today. That's why Kharkiv was successful, in large measure because of these weapons, these new weapons that were more accurate and longer range. So talk about what's worked. You can use all kinds of examples because everything has worked to a certain extent. But sometimes we don't focus on that and the taxpayers of America need to know that their hard-earned tax dollars have gone to something that is really making a huge difference in Ukraine. And finally, this is an argument that I'm hearing more and more. There was an article today on one of the uh, uh, cable networks on Fox about lack of accountability. First of all, I'm all for accountability. It's not a blank check. But second, if you look at what actually is happening, look at the facts. The end-use monitoring, which is what the military calls it, on the military equipment is unprecedented. And as far as we know right now, and this is another thing that is so extraordinary that I can't believe it will continue, but as far as we know, not a single American weapon that is provided to Ukraine has fallen into the wrong hands. Amazing. Why? Well, because the Ukrainians are being very conservative to ensure that doesn't happen, but also this end-use monitoring has been effective. Think about the aid that goes to the state, to the government, or the aid that's going to the humanitarian organizations, running through the World Bank so you have reports, you have audits, you have the ability to have accountability measures within a structure that's established. Deloitte is there, for those of you who are uh, into uh, accounting. Now, they are there, and they are there not just because the United States wants them there or other countries want them there, because the Ukrainians want them there. So we gotta be sure that every dollar goes to the right place and is properly spent. Because this argument is being made, and that's one of the reasons, Ambassador, to your question, that you see some of this support beginning to wane, that there's somehow not accountability. Well, I would argue that there is, but if there's not adequate accountability, bring it on. We're all for transparency. Nobody is more for it, having met with him several times, than President Zelensky. So I would just suggest some of those as additional arguments to be made at a time where I think we are at a crucial turning point. People talk about the, the, it's at gridlock now and it's a stalemate. Not really, people are dying every day, it's a grind. Actually, the Russians in the Bakhmut area are making some progress. It, it's time right now for us to do a surge. You remember the surge that's been done in previous conflicts, sometimes derided because it didn't work as well because there was never really a military equipment and soldiers and intelligence and so on to back it up, but we need a surge right now. And that would be some of these weapons that the Ukrainians have been asking for for a long time, but it's time. So it is the Leopard 2 tanks from Germany. It is the Abrams A1 and one tanks from the United States. Uh, it is other countries in being freed up to provide heavy weapons that they cannot now because of the license agreements they have with the United States or with Germany or other countries. It is F-16s. I know it takes some time to train up the pilots, but I've talked to the pilots. They're ready to go. Many of them have had some training. Uh, it's these new weapons that are necessary to go further into the occupied parts of Ukraine and maybe into Crimea. 
and that's the attack on missiles and others. So let's do it. Let's go for it. Now's the time. We cannot wait until a spring offensive by the Russians. We have to do it now. So my hope is that not only can we make these good arguments to keep the current aid going, but that we can finally step up to the plate and provide the very weapons that President Zelensky talked about yesterday in the session that have been talked about ever, ever since really the February 24th invasion occurred. And it's time for us to step up to the plate and do that surge and do it now. Okay, we've gone a little bit over time up here with this moderated part of the conversation. We're now ready for audience questions. And I think I know we have the first one right here, and then we have the second one right there. Please. If someone could provide a microphone. Right here. Oops. Uh, thank you very much. I rep represent the Ukrainian energy company DTEC, which is the largest private, and uh, my company has uh, survived 162 uh, shellings by Russians mm -hmm. up to date. Uh, it includes uh, missiles, drones, but also art artillery. Uh, the company lost three power plants because they are captured by Russians, and so we still operate six uh, on the controlled territory. Cool. W with, uh, uh, with these uh, six uh, thermal power plants, we generate 20% of Ukraine's electricity. And uh, I want to give you one figure. It's 1,135 uh, pieces of equipment which have been destroyed by, to date by, by Russian uh, missiles. And we still managed to generate 20% of Ukraine's electricity. If we talk about the grids, because we um, uh, are in charge of 40% of Ukraine's distribution of electricity, we, uh, also, our assets are also attacked all the time, and uh, we lost 9,333 pieces of equipment in grids. And still, we confirm and reconfirm that we will reconnect the wires, we will keep the lights on, we will continue to do so until Ukraine wins, definitely. Uh, then, um, we of course need help with equipment procurement, because yeah, we are very grateful to the ministry, because now all the assistance come, comes, uh, comes through the ministry. Something comes from, from energy companies, from peers who really provide us a lot, but this is not enough. And I would like to ask the um, IFIs if they could please change their rules and procedures so that private energy companies in Ukraine at war can receive IFIs uh, financing to get this equipment, to reconnect, to reconnect the consumers. Uh, because our, yeah, our main task is to keep the lights on. Um, Putin's missiles do not distinguish between private and uh, and the public, while the IFI still do. So let's 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 have this change. And um, yeah, um, I just want to say that we're all at the energy front. Uh, company has lost 131 employees at this at this war. We, re we would always remember each one of them. Uh, but to end on a positive note, I would like to say that yes, we believe in the green future of Ukraine. Uh, all Ukrainian partners will be proud not only of all the efforts that we, we, we go like we do now, but of the Ukraine that we will build after the war. And, and this Ukraine will be distributed, the energy generation will be green, will be distributed, and we will become the green energy hub of Europe. And uh, yeah, we will replace Russia on the energy market of Europe. Okay, thank you. That was actually more of a statement than a question, so it's good to hopefully get a question over here. Ambassador Herbst for perfect moderation. Uh, I'm Natalia Katzer-Wichkowska. I'm former member of parliament and now founder of Ukrainian Sustainable Fund. So there was really good discussion. I also want to refer to Yulia notes that, well, it's a very difficult time. And before, uh, before October, we used to talk about reconstruction. It's a very important topic, how it should be structured and how we should channel the funds uh, towards uh, uh, like right uh, uh, economical sectors, but now after our energy sector was hugely destroyed and you know the numbers, we should think how to increase resilience 
and to do it now, not like uh, next year, uh, in three years or in five years, because people are still living in this city. They're disconnected from electricity. It's like very humanitarian issue and economic as well. Uh, so I know personally that a lot of companies, not maybe a lot, but those who energy companies used to work in war zones, they are looking at Ukraine and they wish to help, but they need some insurance and war, uh, war insurance and some risk coverage. So my question actually to the president of EBRD, uh, I know that you are thinking about uh, to create and to expand war insurance uh, and we wish you to accelerate this and uh, to scale it up. And my question also to the senator, so please, um, if OPIC has a very good model and it worked before war. So I also think it should be um, accelerated, expanded, and to make it much easier for foreign companies, gas companies uh, who want to invest in uh, gas production or in the green energy or some small, very easy to manage uh, project which could uh, actually help even one, two, three villages or small cities to be self-sufficient. Just to make these companies enable to invest this year, next year, like this year also possible. And it's quite important to think about like next months and to sustain to make Ukrainians stronger now. So what we've been doing in terms of uh, insurance is working through the banking se sector. So we have, we have risk sharing facility and we, where we cover half of the risk um, the bank is uh, taking when they expand the loan. And with this mechanism we brought, we managed to uh, bring in the financing of the economy 200 million from the banking sector on top of our own financing. So that's what we have. And it, we had agreement with a number of banks and we have been developing that in particular in agribusiness, but all it's open to all sectors. So it relies on the local banks and, and we cover half of the risk. But we are also thinking uh, to develop new, I mean, innovative product, a new kind of product in order to cover the political risk, um, in, which is, I think, in the current circumstances, it will be very difficult to have because it's very, I mean, high price and, and difficult to evaluate, but it will be, in any case, very much needed in the um, reconstruction phase because it's likely, I mean, we may be also in a sort of gray situation where we need to, re we start to need reconstructing while the situation is not, I mean, it's not full-fledged piece agreement and you may still have some, I mean, um, emergencies of, of some valuance. What I completely agree with you is that we should, I mean, do our utmost to provide support now and not to, I mean, the reconstruction will be important and so forth, but supporting Ukraine now is more important because whatever we do now will be also... I mean, savings for the reconstruction. The more we can support Ukraine now, the less costly the reconstruction will be and the less difficult it will be. So I fully agree and happy to work on any new solution. Thank you. Senator, do you want to jump in on the second Well, part I of took that? a note on, on OPEC. The Development Finance Corporation is probably the, the right entity now, and I'll check on that. But, you know, one thing I was thinking when the minister was talking about the need for uh, high voltage transformers is that, you know, as the energy sector, whether it's a power plant or whether it's the, you know, the public utility system is being destroyed, obviously building it back, you want to build it back better. And, and specifically to get away from the Soviet era equipment. When I was there talking to some of the workers, they were saying that they have on the shelf some transformers and other equipment they can use, and in your case probably some of the equipment they can use from the power plant that dates back and what they really would prefer to do is to move on to some better technology that's more efficient um, and so less energy use but also more efficient for you know the ratepayers and go ahead and start the modernization to your point so i think that I think that makes sense and again the us money is going through various different uh, ways but the energy fund is one and I'll check on, uh, if you give me your information, I'll check on the Development Finance Corporation, see if they can provide that guarantee you're talking about for private investment. Um, we Thank you. We are already at the um, end point, but I'm willing to entertain two questions. If the questioners can keep their question to under one minute, I'll cut you off if you don't. <laughs> All right? Oh, please, Mr. Minister. Oh, excuse me. All right. Okay. 
Uh, oh, let's go yeah. uh, colleagues, just uh, summarize and just would like to say from our ministry that really thank you for this opportunity. And uh, recently, uh, Fatih Barol, uh, this is head of International Energy Agency, called the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act the most important climate agreement since Paris Agreement. And we are convinced that Ukraine post-war green recovery will be another link in this global push forward uh, uh, climate neutrality. And this is very important, that investing in projects for Ukraine's energy transition is increasing a better energy security for whole Ukraine. And all business, you are welcome to come. And we will talk about exciting new projects in green energy in Ukraine. And our minister and ministry open for communication with you. And this is really important because energy security of whole European continent depends on our victory. Thank you. We agree with that. Okay, one one question, one minute. Okay, right there. One minute. My clock, my clock. Thank you very much. For a very short question to Madame la Présidente. La Présidente, um, continuing what you have just mentioned, um, that you have risk sharing, because I'm a banker, Ukraine Gas Bank, uh, financing all big infrastructure projects and eco and sustainability. Uh, you mentioned that you are now developing a new product and uh, covering uh, war risks, under war risks coverage. Could you please tell us um, which will be the industries where you plan too, um, too early. I can too early. Too early. Yeah. Except for energy, yes, because I know we are talking a lot about, and we know that money will go there. But any other? Too early. Too early. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Uh, over here. This is very quick. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this really. Well, it was clear you didn't want to. So one minute you have. Sorry. I'm Alistair McBain. I used to be a CEO of an energy company. Forty-five seconds. But okay. Mm -hmm. um, my question is about asymmetric warfare. The, uh, the, the Russians are using the Shahed 136 drone for a reason. The reason is, I don't know whether it costs $40,000 or $20,000, somewhere in the middle. If you use a Patriot missile to shoot it down, that's half a million dollars gone. Yeah. Are there any ideas that, that anybody has about how to combat that asymmetry? I have one. I'm willing to share it. But, uh, or outside okay. this panel, if necessary. Good, okay. good question. And you want to take let, that? Let, let's talk about that off offline. But yesterday we did a session with Palantir, <laughs> and uh, we talked to, with, with the uh, Minister of uh, Digital Transformation, and he had a specific... Uh, he's been given responsibility and trusted by the government to deal with the drone, drone issue, both on the offensive side and the defensive side. And he has some specific ideas of how to use technology. So I want to talk to you about it, but it, it would be far less expensive than a Patriot missile. From I, I will answer your question in 35 seconds. We already, we meaning the collective West, are trying to provide layered air defense. So you know before the decision was made on Patriots, the decision was made on something called NASAMs. And there are other um, anti-air systems that are making their way to Ukraine to handle threats at different altitudes and at different prices. This problem has not been solved, but it is being addressed. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. It was a very good conversation.